name a company that you work with or have done business with that you feel like has a complete obsession with you, the customer. Okay, Chick-fil-A. Now let's, let's unpack Chick-fil-A for just a second because one of the only fast food restaurants that have to have police officers direct traffic. <laughs> right or wrong? Yeah, awesome. And you would think other fast food restaurants would pick up on that. But it's almost like if they say it's my pleasure one more time, you just want to punch them in the face sometimes. Just joking about that part, okay? <laughs> but but the, the, very passionate about the experience. Very passionate about the customer, right? Because that's what we're talking about today. And how does your role play into this, okay? So you said uh, Chick-fil-A. I heard Publix. Disney World. Okay. All right. So let's go Publix. What about Publix? They're just always happy and ready to, can I help you? Can I help you? Like right. Down the aisle, take your groceries out. Yeah. Take your groceries yeah. out. Yeah. It is a And how, how many people, let me just ask this question. How many people are willing to spend more money for a better experience? Okay. Now you're going to find some commodity shoppers out there in the world, right? That's all about pricing. But a lot of people, if you just track what you do in a day, a lot of people will spend more money for a better experience. Now, in the, in the downturn, here's what we saw. It was called trading, trading down and trading up, is that people that shopped at Publix started shopping at Kroger. People shopping at Kroger started shopping at, uh, you know, maybe Walmart. People that shopped at some of those places maybe shopped at Aldi. Some people shopped at Family Dollar or Dollar General. Some people did not trade back up when the economy bounced back because they said, I'm willing to sacrifice the customer experience to get it cheaper. You with me? But what I have found is that some people end back up going to a better customer experience. So you mentioned Disney, right? Okay. And one of the things I, we went through this when I went on the Disney cruise, uh, they only made one mistake the whole time. And what I was most impressed with was how they attacked the mistake when they made it. They didn't get defensive. Most people, when you give them feedback about their customer experience, the first thing to do is get defensive. I call it their defense attorney shows up. And they start telling you how you're wrong and they're right, how you're a bozo and they're not. I want you to always remember something. When your customers give you feedback, listen and respond. Listen and react. Don't listen and get defensive. Because they're giving you what you need to know, right? The purpose of any business is to create a customer and to get that customer to a much better state. I used this example earlier. State Farm had a huge campaign a couple years ago that we get people to a better state while simultaneously they couldn't get their agents to actually call their customers. You see how that's hypocritical? We're going to get you to a much better state, but we don't want to actually talk to you. Deal with you. So the number one complaint was they never heard from, the, they never heard from their agent. I don't have a real relationship with my agent, right? Jake doesn't show up at 2 o'clock in the morning at my house on State Farm. I mean, he's not there. So, so, so you, you follow me here? Anybody got any, any, any else that's a customer obsession? Because there's a trend here. The companies that have customer obsession and deliver make the most money. Okay? They have high profit margins. They're very successful. They can grow and expand. They can hire new people. Southwest. Southwest. And think about this. They give you a basic service, but the way they do it. Okay? And a lot of times when I have a chance to fly on any airline, I still choose Southwest because I can expect to get there on time. It'd be a consistent experience, right? I have, I have the same expectation. I'm going to get the peanuts and the pretzels and that's it, right? But they're going to be friendly. They're going to have a little fun. They're going to take something that's typically kind of stressful and make it okay, right? And you can see a direct difference between other airlines and how they serve their people. Okay? So, so what we're going to talk about today is how does your role, how do you become customer obsessed? Because your role does play into this, right or wrong? Yeah. And you may not see it every day, but until you understand and really get this concept, right? Until you really slow down and understand how the better we get with this customer, maybe even our own internal customers, the better we're going to be able to deliver to an external customer. And so, and so over the past couple of weeks, I've been studying the biggest companies in the world, and, and they're specifically their CEOs, Amazon, Airbnb, um, and I've been looking at what they do, and they all start with the customer obsession. See, all of those companies started because people were very unhappy with something else. 
Airbnb, Airbnb started because people needed places to stay. They didn't always want to stay in a hotel. You, you know, you could have another person's house. You could trade up for the weekend, whatever the case may be. Okay? Uber started because of the miserable taxi experiences people had. It was actually started because the, the, the founder was in Paris and couldn't get a taxi. So they were late for a wedding, and the taxi driver was rude to him, and he said, man, I'm going to create something. Wouldn't it be cool if you could just get a personalized car from your phone at any time that you wanted them and not be treated like this? Right? Most big companies start because somebody's very unhappy with something, very frustrated with something, and they started something. Now, the challenge in the mortgage business is what? How many mortgage companies are there in the world? When you see banks coming into a market, like I live in Murfreesboro, and every week there's a new bank. And you know why there's new banks? When you see new banks opening up on every corner, that means there's opportunity, right? Just a few weeks ago, I think Rutherford County was the, what, was in the top 10 of the fastest growing cities, or Murfreesboro is one of the top 15 fastest growing cities in the United States. Not in Tennessee, in the country. And when that many people are flooding into an area, it means opportunity. Same thing's happening in Nashville, right? But there's lots of commoditization, which means there's too many people competing for the same space. And when it's an average experience, there's nothing for me to talk about. See, the reason people are talking about the predators things, you know, I was on this plane last night coming back from Minnesota, and I was thinking about, hey, I was thinking about how many people wouldn't show up to work today <laughs> because of the predators game. Uh, <laughs> right? Or show up and not quite be clicking on every cylinder. You know what I'm saying? Uh, but but my, my point was, the reason this is such a big deal is because it's uncommon. So I want you to remember something. People do not talk about common things. They talk about uncommon things. So if you want to cheapen anything, just make it common. That which is rare is valuable. When something is very rare, it's considered valuable. Everybody follow me here. Well, when I go through a mortgage experience, I've gone through four in my lifetime. Don't remember the first one. Okay, number one reason people don't refer their real estate agent after the transaction or their mortgage originator is because they don't remember their name. Now, what would it say about the experience that I just created for you is we went through supposedly one of the largest transactions of your life and I don't even remember who you are. Somebody asked me about you and I'm like, I don't, you know, short, bald-headed dude, I don't remember his name, <laughs> right? What would it say? That, you know what that's called? Very minimal impact. One I remember because the mortgage originator did something special and he had, when I went to do, sign the title, he had a car there for me and they, they parked my car for me because it was a crowded parking lot and, and, and he said, if it's raining, we'll have an umbrella out there for you. He made sure the title company had the papers ready for me because they said, I know your time is very critical. So he added a little special in that one and I remember it. All the rest of them, I just felt like cattle being herded through the deal. Now, uh, here's what I want you to know. I am not a transaction. And I told you I worked in the prison system for four years and one of the things that broke my heart is they were just numbers. They never called them by name. You were just a number. You follow me? Time for you to eat, time for you to use the bathroom, time for you to do this. They call them by numbers and that's it. Well, it's hard to rehabilitate a person when their self-worth is very low. You, you follow me here? Well, here's what I want you to know. All these mortgages you're doing, they're not just a number. They're a real person. They got real problems. They got real issues. They got real hopes. They got real dreams. And although you may not always see it, you're, you play a very important part of this. So how do you become obsessed with doing your part right so it serves the customer? Okay? And that's really what all the great companies in the world do. Okay? So we're going to look at that today. How do you become, become obsessed? And one of the, one of the hot topics in the, in the leadership session this morning was when we give crumbs to each other, like I give you crumbs, I'm kind of not giving you my best effort, so I kind of halfway do things, halfway do files, don't follow through. When I give you crumbs, this ultimately hurts one person. Outside of my relationship with you, who it really hurts is the customer. Everybody follow me here? And if you are truly obsessed with the customer experience, then I can't give people backstage crumbs. You, you follow me here? Because if, if I don't deliver the goods for you, it's ultimately going to hurt that customer. And if it does hurt that customer, whether they know it or not, like rolling in on two wheels to do, to do, a, to do a loan, 
does not help the customer because it's so stressful on everybody. And when they're stressed, I, here's what I remember. How do I feel when I'm with you? When I'm with you, do I feel better about me? And if I feel stressed or, or anxious or a lot of anxiety when I'm with you, guess what I don't want to do? <laughs> I don't want to come back for round two with that. But what if when I'm with you, I feel like a million bucks? I feel like the most important person in the world because of how you make me feel. You truly value me. You see, the, 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 Churchill does not pay any person in this room. I know you may think they do, but they don't. Every person in this room is paid by one person, the customer. Churchill is just a conduit from the customer, right, to you. That's all it is. I don't pay the employees who work for me. My customers do. You do. You, you follow me here? So, so, so you got it. once you get that in your mind, I need to come back and be obsessed with how do I get you to a much better place, okay? And more importantly, how to backstage we get each other to a much better place. So we're going to look at that crumbs concept, okay? We're going to come back and talk about the numbers. So here's the question I want you asking. There are four types of customers we're, we talk about a lot here at Churchill, okay? I'll give you extra credit if somebody can tell me what they are in just a second. <coughs> give you a little lead time. And if you heard it before, you can't give that, you can't tell it. But, but, but here's the question a lot of people ask after the experience, because you guys do social surveys. And those surveys look good, okay? And, and, some, and many times they're really good, right? Fours, five, 4.5. Five, whatever the experience, but 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 there's only one problem with a survey. Is I actually can lie on the survey, and high percentages of people do just to get the survey out of the way, right? It's like hey, five, 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 good, move on. But that's not the real problem of the survey. The real problem is I could actually give you all fives, and never have a conversation with another person about using your services, which is the real problem here is where these conversations really take place are in real estate offices, on back patios, at lunch. They don't happen as a result. You follow me here? The survey kind of gives us some feedback, but it actually may not tell the whole story. So here's the real question we should be asking. This is a question Airbnb asked their customers. Now, how many people have ever stayed in Airbnb before? Now, how many people had a positive experience? Anybody have a negative experience? Okay, now just look at that. You're staying in another person's house. So Airbnb is worth $35 billion today. Marriott Hotels is only worth $20 billion. Airbnb is one of the largest places of, of a, a hotel or a place to stay that does not own one property. Uber is the largest transportation company that doesn't own one vehicle. Now think about that. Look at all the positive experiences here. When you listen to the founders of Airbnb talk about the experience, it started as one roommate, his rent went up and he, didn't, he didn't, couldn't pay it. And another roommate said, hey, come over to my house and sleep on an air mattress and I'll feed you a little breakfast. Air, bed, and breakfast. Now think about that. That's where the company started. Is what if we could get people to rent their houses out or their rooms out? But here's the question they ask. Not what a five-star experience would be like. What would a seven-star experience look like? Not what a five-star experience. So I just stayed in a house in Malibu, California. And beautiful house up in the mountains. If you've never been to Malibu, it's a beautiful place to go. And I stayed like way, way, way up. And it combines mountains and ocean. So it's really cool, right? I mean, really cool. Like you're sitting there looking at the ocean and it, just, it is just breathtaking. But the way they founded that company is they said this, if you want a seven star experience, number one, ask key questions about the person staying at your house. So I did an interview before I stayed there. So they sent me a list of questions. The person actually called me. They asked me key questions about why I was coming to Malibu, what I wanted to do, okay? And their thought process was the way they should do it is have a person there to meet and greet you, to let you in the house. That's the, that was one of their first things. Two, they wanted to explain how to use the house. Here's what you're going to need to know. Three, if there's places to eat, here's the great place to eat because you're not from here. But when, during that customer profile, what if I said that I liked, uh, I want to try out surfing? And one of the things they really wanted to do was always bring a gift to the customer. So some of the Airbnb houses I stayed at actually had a gift for me. Here's a little gift basket. Here's what you need to know about Nashville, right? But what if they took it a step further and said, 
I know you want to try surfing. We've already scheduled half a day of surfing lessons for you while you're in Malibu because they listened. That's the way the founders actually designed it is that we were going to let you stay here and bring hospitality. The bed and breakfast part was hospitality. You follow me here? Now, when you think about it, a lot of times in the mortgage world, what's our number one thing? What are we thinking on the operational side? How do we get this puppy across the finish line? For the love of God, how do we just get it, right? Just get it closed. The customer who's out there in the world does not care what you got to do to get it closed. You don't get brownie points for working a little bit harder or pushing hard to get it closed. They just know this. They were promised something. This is critical. I think Josh Phillips said this in our last session. One thing, when you make a promise to another person, it binds you together. He said two things binds a person together. One is a promise and one is unforgiveness. It's pretty good, isn't it? When you make a promise to another person, it's kind of a binding contract. Well, when you break that promise, Here's what I know. I don't have to come back to you again. And there's two places Churchill is leaving a lot of money on the table for opportunity. One is in follow-up because of the enormous amount of leads that are coming in and they're not getting followed up appropriately. Seven to 15 touches. And two is after the customer has done a mortgage with you. Everybody with me here? Most stats say every real estate transaction should be worth 5.7 referrals. But 98% of people in the real estate industry never call a customer back once they put them in a home. Everybody follow me here? So there's an enormous amount of money that's left because well, let's say I did my mortgage with you and, and I never heard back from you, number one, in a meaningful way. And when I mean meaningful, it's not a drip campaign, not automation, okay, but real relationship. So, so I'm not sending you the 5.7 referrals. And you may not get my next mortgage. And if, if I do, average person does four to eight in their lifetime. See how much money's left right there through that experience? Well, if I'm obsessed with that customer, I need to get you to a much better place. So here's the question you should be asking. Not how can we make it better for you. And by the way, if, if you were to ask that question to your customers now, what do they tell you? How can we make it better for you? What do you think they say? Right? Hey, you're fine. That's a, what a great compliment there, huh? <laughs> hey, you're fine. Average experience. Here's the worst thing in the world could happen. You ask, hey, what was it like with Churchill? And they go, just another mortgage company. Okay? That's not the question. The question is, how do we make it so good for you, you run and tell everybody else? A lot of people aren't used to good service in so many areas that they really don't know even what great service is, except when you happen upon it and you go, wow. Like, That's right. <clears throat> you go through a McDonald's drive through in the morning to get a cup of coffee or something, and most of the time, it's here's your food. Yep. It's the one that greets you and says, hey, how are you doing? And thank you so much that stands out in your mind. So a lot of times when you ask somebody, how can we help make you better, sometimes they don't have a benchmark. That's right. Do. But when you do hear from people, yeah. those are the ones you got to definitely listen to. That's right. How do we make it? So how do we make it so good that you run and tell other people? So I've showed this. That's the question we should be asking. So I showed this. Um, to our last group, our leadership group, and, I, and, and I've shown this to you, but it's really critical that you get it. After this experience is over, every customer that comes to Churchill is one of these four people. They are passive toward you. That means they've done business with you one time, but there was nothing unique about it, so they probably will never come back. But we also lost what? What else did we lose? The referability, the lifetime referrals. Then there's the detractor, person that is spreading negative comments about you and your brand. And here would be my question, do you actually care about that? Do you care? Okay? Or do you just write them off and say they're crazy? Right? Didn't know what they Then there's promoters. These people are saying positive things about you, right? When solicited, but they are not fighting for you. See how the survey could lead us in the wrong direction? We could get those fives and see five, 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 five and think, oh my gosh, our referral is going to be ridiculous. But I could actually give you a five and never have one conversation about Churchill unless I'm asked. Hey, what would you think about it? Oh, it's a good experience, right? Here's where we're trying to get to. This is a much higher level. These are actively engaged with helping you gain new market share. They're, they're, so the word mortgage comes up, I'm buying a new house. Here's what this person says, Grant, 
I will not let you use anybody else in the world except Churchill. And let me tell you why. See, you're here at Churchill, you don't even know that conversation is taking place. Right? So the question becomes, how do we get people to that level? How do you get another person to fight for you like that? What do you think? So here's, here's some of the philosophies. No amount of customer service training will take a disengaged worker and, and make them give great service. Do you believe that? Yes. <laughs> we could put you in a room and say, hey, we're going to bring in Coach Burt, and he's going to motivate you every single morning. I had a, mo uh, a real estate agent once say, how much would it cost me for you to motivate me every 15 minutes? <laughs> I'm like, it's a lot of money. <laughs> and I, I don't want to do If that's what you need, you, I don't want you, okay? But, but, but no amount of pump up, psychology, motivation, getting you warmed up is going to make you be obsessed with this customer experience. If you see your work as, hey, this is just a, look, I got to just get through the day. Let me just get through this day. That's it. So that's my number one objective today. Right? Then it's Wednesday. It's hump day. Halfway through the misery. Then it's Friday. Thank God it's Friday. Then I get, on Sunday, I start this whole process again. If that's your mindset, your customer obsession ain't on the radar screen. Right or wrong? So here's how I want you to think about your work. I want you to start thinking about your work as the distribution channel for your talent. See, what you're seeing at the Predators, all you're seeing is people operate at very high levels distributing their talents to the world. And the world is basically rewarding them in the form of love, money, recognition, affirmation. That's all you're seeing. And it's really cool. That's why the playoffs are good because you get to see people operate at very high levels. They're not operating at a common level. Now they're operating at a very high level. Well, I want you to think of yourself like that. When you operate at a very high level, the world rewards you in the form of love and affirmation and reputation and money. If you operate at a very basic level, the world says, hey, you're pretty good. You're not really giving us a whole lot. You're going to get a little bit back. That's how you should see your work. Okay? So the question becomes, what would, he, I want you to, I want to have a conversation with you and ask you this. Why would you personally become obsessed with the customer experience? You personally. Some people say, for money. Because I think the people who are most obsessed with the customer are going to make the most money. Right? People who are going to be obsessed are going to make the most money. Everybody, are we in agreement with this? People that serve the customer best are always going to make the most money. It's that simple. You may be doing it because, and I was thinking about operations when, when, when I was put this part in here. As I was thinking about you, like if I was an operations person, what would give me personal satisfaction? Like would it be the completion of something? Would it be to be a part of something? Would it be to get something from here to there, to know I played a part, right? Some people are motivated by progress. And I'm a, I'm a part of this equation. And without me, I'm a, I'm a very important part, okay? Could it be affirmation? You need to be told that you're really good at what it is you do, okay? I think when you distribute, I got two text messages this morning. I almost broke down and started crying when I read them. They were from my own customers just saying, man, something you said really got me to a much better level. You follow me? Did I get paid? No. Well, you did. There you go. <laughs> I, I really did get Here, in my, in my opinion, I got paid. Now, they're paying me to be their coach. But, man, that's a whole lot better. Sometimes, I won't say that in the money. The money's real good. But what I'm saying is I, I felt, man, that was good. What about this one, though? This is when you start playing at very high levels. Is right? There's a scripture in the Bible in John that talks about where the sower, the sower and the reaper enjoy the harvest together. <laughs> and as soon as I read that, I was like, man, that's the way it should be set up. Is that you can't do this without me and I can't do it without you. But, but it's not just a one-sided relationship where you benefit from it. We actually both benefit together when we're in this together. You, you follow me here? Now, and when you get to that level, you are very, very interested in taking something that's here and getting it to here. You were very interested in taking nothingness and turning it into somethingness. You were very interested in taking low-level resource to high level. See, a, a mortgage is a manufactured product sent through an assembly line that solves a problem for a person who can't pay for a house in cash. Everybody follow me here? Money only changes hands when problems are solved. It's just a product that is manufactured through the assembly line and then pumped out for a person that solves a problem. So when you think about it, though, when you start saying, my job is to get this to much higher levels, and I'm a part of that, Okay, so I want to ask you that question. What, 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 would, what would prompt you to be obsessed with the customer experience? And they may not be up here. Somebody earlier said to be a part of something bigger. Like coming to work at Churchill is a part of something much bigger than just working at a mortgage company, right? 
you probably worked at a company that didn't care about culture, maybe didn't care about people, right? I've worked for companies like that. I coach companies like that. Sometimes, you know, and I use the line that Steve Jobs said to John Scully when he was trying to recruit him to Apple, is he took a walk with him and he said, Scully, you can spend the rest of your life selling sugar water if that's what you want your legacy to be. Or you can come to Apple and help us change the world. Isn't that a great line? I look at some people and say, you can manufacture mortgages if that's all you want to do and make some money. Or you can come over here and do something special with us. That's a whole lot bigger than just manufacturing a product through an assembly line. So out of these things right here, which one rows your boat? And if it's not up there, say, hey, here, here's where I get fed. Because you need to know why. You, people ask me all the time, why do you do what you do? Why do you push so hard? Why, do you, why are you so obsessed with going to the next level? Why do you, you understand what I'm saying? And sometimes it's hard for me to answer that question. Sometimes I go, you know what? I don't know. It's just something that was implanted in me very early in life. I don't know if it came from a single mom. I don't know if it came from scratching and clawing. I don't know if it came from having nothing to come to something. I, don't, I, don't, I can't tell you that. Does that make sense? But as I get older, I start to go, I really like number four. Where I really get fed is when I get a person from here to there. And we reap the harvest together. So what is it for you? Take a second tell the person beside you. What do you, what, what do you think would cause you to have an obsession on the customer? Okay? Don't be shy. Okay. All right, let me ask you this question. If, if all of my time and energy is just spent trying to get my own self motivated, am I, can I really, am I really in the business of getting other people to a much higher level if all of my time and energy is just spent trying to get myself to a very basic level? Yes or no? No. Right? Like I can't move this ball down the field and give you something I don't have. I can't give you energy if I don't have it. Okay? So, so a lot of people wake up, and like I said, they're in, they're in just a survival mode to get through the day, and they really don't even have enough energy to get another person or something to a much better state because they're spending so much time trying to get their own self to just a basic state. You follow me here? And it, as interdependent as this is, and as interconnected as a mortgage business is, when you break your promise to me, it really does hurt this whole process, right or wrong. So when you supply a product to me that is halfway done or half-hearted done or you didn't seem to care or you, 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 when you break that promise to me, it really ends up hurting the consumer. Okay? So when, I, when you hear me talk about crumbs, one of the biggest reasons I see people give each other crumbs is they become too familiar with each other. They become too comfortable with each other. Right? It's like we need to do this better, but we kind of let our guard down and let everybody get too relaxed. And because everybody's too relaxed, there's not enough accountability, the process is flawed, we're, and we're putting, up, we're putting forth just a very mediocre product. And I, here's what I would tell you, the mortgage world's too, too competitive to put forth a mediocre product and win. There's too many people competing for the same space. There's not four of you out there, there's 400 of you out there. <laughs> so I really want you to remember on the operational side, there's a pride, there's got to come a personal pride with your role that says, I'm going to serve you and you serve me and we're not going to let each other down. And I will, I will follow through with what I'm supposed to follow through with. So that when I give you this, it's going to be world class. And I don't care what your motivation is. I just need you to be motivated. <laughs> I need you to care enough, right? And so th th today's was about customer obsession. If I understand that, the, you know which customers I like? The ones that pay their bills. 
I got high maintenance customers, low maintenance customers, and no maintenance customers. And you know what? I love every single one of them. As long as they pay, <laughs> I love them, right? Because those people allow me to do what I do for a living every day. And so don't ever forget that. At the end of the day, you're pumping out a product that's either going to get somebody to the next level or it's not. And your personal pride in it is going to really play a big role here. So just don't give each other crumbs. Fair enough? Miss Laura? All right. You up? Very good. Yep. All right. Customer obsession. Thank you very much.